International Trade This chapter explores international trade in goods and services, examining its benefits, volume, and patterns. It also explores the main theories of why nations trade. Chapter Objectives After studying this chapter, you should be able to describe the relation between international trade volume and world output and identify overall trade patterns. Describe mercantilism and explain its impact on world powers and their colonies. Explain the theories of absolute and comparative advantage. Explain the factor proportions and international product life cycle theories. Explain the new trade and national competitive advantage theories. Overview of international trade. International trade is the purchase sale or exchange of goods and services across national borders. One way to measure the importance of trade is to examine the volume of an economy's trade relative to total output. The main benefits of international trade are that it creates new entrepreneurial opportunities, expands the choice of goods and services, and creates jobs. The U.S. Department of Commerce estimates that for every $1 billion increase in export, 22,800 U.S. jobs are created. World merchandise exports are $16 trillion, and service exports are nearly $3.8 trillion. Trade in merchandise is around 80% of total trade, whereas services account for around 20%. While slower world economic output slows international trade, higher output spurs trade. Trade slows in a recession as people are uncertain about the future and buy less. Also, when an economy is in a recession, the currency is weak, slowing imports because they are more expensive. This table shows the world's largest exporters of merchandise and services. Perhaps not surprisingly, the United States ranks third in merchandise exports behind Germany and China. International trade patterns. Trade volume and world output provide insight into the international trade environment, but do not disclose trading partners. Trade among the world's high income economies accounts for roughly 60% of total world merchandise trade. Two way trade between high income countries and low- and middle-income nations accounts for about 34% of world merchandise trade. And trade between low- and middle-income nations accounts for only about 6% of world merchandise trade. This table gives us a more detailed idea of who trade with whom. Intra-regional trade accounts for around 70% of Europe's exports, 56% of Asia's exports, and less than 38% of North America's exports. Some economists call this century the Pacific century, referring to the expected future growth of Asian economies and the expected shift in trade flows from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Trade dependence and independence. Countries lie on a scale with total trade dependence at one end and total independence at the other. Complete independence was considered desirable from the 16th through 18th centuries, but is not desirable today. The effect on developing and transition nations. Developing and transition nations often depend on their developed neighbors with whom they share borders. For example, Germany is the single most important trading partner of Central and Eastern European nations. Dangers of trade dependency. If a nation experiences economic recession or political turmoil, the dependent nation can experience economic problems. Trade today is characterized by a certain degree of interdependency, which often reflects trade between a company's subsidiaries. Now try to answer this question. What are the patterns of global and regional trade flows that we see among nations? Trade among high-income economies accounts for roughly 60% of total world merchandise trade. Trade between high-income countries and low- and middle-income nations accounts for about 34% of world merchandise trade. Intra-regional trade accounts for nearly 70% of Europe's exports, 
56% of Asia's exports and 30% of North America's exports. Some economists call this the Pacific Century, referring to the expected future growth of Asian economies and expected shift in trade flows from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Theories of International Trade It was not until the 15th century that people tried to explain why trade occurs. Efforts continue to refine existing trade theories and develop new ones. Let's now explore some of these main theories. Foundations of Mercantilism The trade theory of mercantilism argues that nations should accumulate financial wealth, usually in the form of gold, by encouraging exports and discouraging imports. Other measures of a nation's well-being, such as living standards and human development, are irrelevant. It was practiced from around 1500 to the late 1700s by European nations, including Britain, France, the Netherlands, Portugal, and Spain. How mercantilism worked? Trade was to benefit mother countries. Colonies were exploitable resources. Trade surpluses. Nations increase wealth through a trade surplus, which is when the value of a nation's export exceeds the value of the imports. Trade deficits were to be avoided at all cost. Government intervention. Governments intervene in international trade to maintain a trade surplus. They ban certain imports, impose tariffs and quotas and subsidize home-based industries to expand exports. Removal of gold and silver from the nation was outlawed. Colonialism Mercantilist nations acquired colonies as sources of inexpensive raw materials and markets for higher-priced finished goods. Trade between mercantilist nations and their colonies expanded wealth and created armies and navies to control colonial empires and protect shipping. Flaws of Mercantilism The main problem with mercantilism is that it viewed international trade as a zero-sum game. This is the idea that a nation benefits only at the expense of other nations. But if all nations barricade their markets from imports and push their exports onto others, international trade would be severely restricted. Also, it kept colonial markets poor. They received little money for raw materials, but were charged high prices for finished goods. Absolute advantage Absolute advantage is the ability of a nation to produce a good more efficiently than any other nation. This means that the nation can produce a greater output using the same of fewer resources. Adam Smith reasoned that international trade should not be burdened by tariffs and quotas, but should flow according to market forces. A country should produce the goods in which it holds an absolute advantage and trade with others to obtain the goods it needs but does not produce efficiently. Assume a world of two countries, rice land and tea land, with two products, rice and tea, where transport costs nothing, each nation produces and consumes its own rice and tea. In rice land, one resource unit produces a ton of rice, but five units are needed to produce a ton of tea. In tea land, six resource units produce a ton of rice, but three units are needed to produce a ton of tea. Thus, rice land has an absolute advantage in rice production, and tea land has an absolute advantage in tea production. Gains from specialization and trade. Although each country now specializes and world output increases, both countries face a problem. Rice land consumes only its rice and tea land consumes only its tea. The problem can be resolved through trade. Although tea land does not gain as much as rice land, it gets more rice than it would without trade. Actual gains depend on the total resources of each country and the demand for each good in each country. The theory of absolute advantage destroys the mercantilist idea that international trade is a zero-sum game. 
Because both countries gain, international trade is a positive sum game. The theory argues against restrictive trade policies and for nations to instead open their doors to trade so that people obtain more goods more cheaply in order to raise living standard. Comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is the inability of a nation to produce a good more efficiently than other nations, but an ability to produce that good more efficiently than it does any other good. Thus, trade is still beneficial even if one country is less efficient in the production of the goods, as long as it is less inefficient in the production of one of the goods. Gains from specialization and trade. Suppose that rice land now holds absolute advantages in the production of both rice and tea. In rice land, one resource unit produces a ton of rice, but two are needed to produce a ton of tea. In tea land, six resource units still produce a ton of rice, and three units are still needed to produce a ton of tea. Thus, rice land has absolute advantages in producing both goods. Although tea land has absolute disadvantages in rice and tea, it has a comparative advantage in tea. Tea land produces tea more efficiently than it produces rice. By specializing and trading, tea land gets double the rice than if it produced the rice itself, and rice land gets twice as much tea than if it produced the tea itself. Assumption and Limitations the theories of absolute and comparative advantage focus on production efficiency or productivity. Despite their powerful predictive capabilities, these are limited by their assumptions. First, we assume that countries are only driven by the maximization of production and consumption. This is not often the case. Governments get involved in trade for many reasons, for example, out of concern for workers and consumers. Second, the theories assume that there are only two countries engaged in the production and consumption of two goods. In reality, more than 180 countries and countless products are produced, traded, and consumed. Third, it is assumed that there are no transportation costs. In reality, transportation costs are a major expense of international trade. Fourth, the theories consider labor the only resource for production and is mobile within each nation but cannot be transferred. Other resources are clearly needed in production and labor is becoming more mobile. Finally, it is assumed that specialization does not result in efficiency gains. In fact, specialization results in increased knowledge of a task and future improvements. Choose the correct answer to this question. The correct answer is B. Comparative advantage. When a nation cannot produce a good more efficiently than other nations, but it can produce that good more efficiently than it does any other good, we say this is a case of comparative advantage. Factor proportion theory. Factor proportion theory states that countries produce and export goods that require resources that are abundant and import goods that require resources in short supply. Thus, the theory focuses on the productivity of the production process. Labor versus land and capital equipment. Factor proportion theory breaks resources into two categories, labor and land and capital equipment. It predicts that the country will specialize in products that require labor if labor cost is low relative to land and capital cost and vice versa. Factor proportion theory is conceptually appealing. For example, Australia has much land and a small population. Its exports consist of products that require much land, whereas imports consist of manufactured and consumer goods. Leon Tief Paradox Despite its conceptual appeal, factor proportion theory is not supported by studies that examine trade flows. Wassily Leontiev tested whether the United States, which uses an abundance of capital equipment, exports good requiring capital-intensive production and imports good requiring labor-intensive production. He found that U.S. exports require more labor-intensive production than its imports, called the Leontiev paradox. 
One explanation is that factor proportion theory considers a country's production factors to be homogeneous, particularly labor. But labor scales vary greatly within a country. International Product Life Cycle The International Product Life Cycle theory states that the company will begin exporting its product and later undertake foreign direct investment as the product moves through its life cycle. This means a country's export eventually becomes its import. Stages of the product life cycle In the new product stage, stage 1, high purchasing power and demand of buyers spur a company to design and introduce a new product concept. Although initially there is virtually no export market, exports increase late in the new product stage. In the maturing product stage, stage 2, the domestic market and markets abroad become fully aware of the existence of the product and its benefits. Demand rises and is sustained over a fairly lengthy period of time. Near the end of the maturity stage, the product generates sales in developing nations and manufacturing is established there. In the standardized product stage, stage 3, competition from other companies selling similar products pressures companies to lower prices in order to maintain sales levels. An aggressive search for low-cost production basis abroad begins, and the home market may begin importing. Limitation of the theory The United States is no longer the sole innovator of products in the world. New products spring up everywhere as the research and development activities globalize. Companies today design new products and make product modifications at a very quick pace. Companies introduce products in many markets simultaneously to recoup a product's research and development cost before sales decline. The theory is challenged by the fact that more companies are operating in international markets from their inception. The internet has made this easier, particularly for small and mid-sized companies. Also, Small companies are more often teaming up with companies in other markets to develop new products and production technologies. Yet the theory retains explanatory power when applied to technology-based products that are eventually mass-produced. New Trade Theory New Trade Theory argues that there are gains to be made from specialization and increasing economies of scale. Companies first to market can create barriers to entry, and government may play a role in assisting its home-based companies. It emphasizes productivity rather than resources. A major part of the theory is the first mover advantage. As specialization and output increase, companies realize economies of scale, and unit production costs decline. Then companies expand, lower prices, and force competitors to produce at a similar level of output to be competitive. A first mover advantage is the economic and strategic advantage gained by being the first company to enter an industry. It creates a barrier to entry for potential rivals and may allow a company to terminate in a product. Some make a case for government assistance. By working together to target new industries, a government and its own based companies can be the first mover in an industry. Briefly describe the new trade theory. Does it focus on productivity put it at odds with the theory of comparative advantage and factor proportion theory? New trade theory says that there are gains to be made from specialization and increasing economies of scale. A company that is first to the market and achieves a first mover advantage can create barriers to entry and government may play a role in assisting its own based companies. Because new trade theory emphasizes productivity rather than a nation resources, it is in line with the theory of comparative advantage, but at odds with factor proportion theory. National competitive advantage. National competitive advantage theory states that a nation's competitiveness in an industry depends on the capacity of the industry to innovate and upgrade. This theory attempts to explain why some nations are more competitive in certain industries. The project diamond consists of factor conditions, demand conditions, related and supporting industries, and firm strategy, structure, and rivalry. Factor conditions 
Porter acknowledges the importance of basic factors such as labor, natural resources, climate, and surface features in what a country produces and exports, but adds the significance of advanced factors. Advanced factors include skill levels of the workforce and quality of the technological infrastructure. They account for the sustained competitive advantage that a country enjoys in a product. Demand conditions Sophisticated buyers in the home market are important to national competitive advantage in the product area. A sophisticated domestic market drives companies to modify existing products to include new design features and develop new products and technologies. Related and supporting industries Companies in internationally competitive industries do not exist in isolation. Supporting industries provide inputs, forming clusters of relative activities in the same region that reinforce productivity and competitiveness. Exporting clusters are those that export products or make investment to compete outside the local area and can lead to long-term prosperity. Firm strategy, structure, and rivalry. Strategic decisions of firms have lasting effects on future competitiveness, but equally important is industry structure and rivalry between companies. The more intense the struggle to survive between domestic companies, the greater is their competitiveness. This heightened competitiveness helps them to compete against imports and against companies that might develop a product presence in their home market. Answer this question by choosing the right concept. National competitive advantage theory states that a nation competitiveness in an industry depends on the capacity of the industry to innovate and upgrade. This chapter, International Trade, explores the benefits of international trade and its volume and pattern in the world today. Trade can free a nation's entrepreneurial spirit and bring economic development. As the value and volume of trade continues to expand worldwide, new theories will likely emerge to explain why countries trade and why they have advantages in producing certain products.